The Money Show. Business Books. A business book featured this evening, Blazing a Trail, Lessons in African Leadership. It's by Lincoln Marley. Kaya Sitole, the independent political analyst, is with us this evening. What drew you, Kaya, to Lincoln Marley's book? Good evening and good evening to the listeners. So, Bruce, I was actually quite curious for a different reason altogether, and I think you probably remember quite well that he spent the better part of his corporate career at Standard Bank, and then suddenly... He was the man in charge of an organization that a lot of us had wished had to exist, and that was an organization that used to be CPS. So when it then emerged that he had written a book, I was sort of quite curious about how he was going to explain his way through that transition, which having listened to who he was before um, he joined CPS, I was struggling to reconcile that shift from one organization to the other. So that was essentially what intrigued me about his story. Okay, um, because... Yeah, the last time I saw him, he was running the Standard Bank card division, and then he went to VBS. When did that transition happen? So that CPS transition happened, I think, around 18 months ago. Um, VBS doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, no, so CPS. What was the the move from Standard Bank to CPS? What is that? Yeah, so now it's, uh, they call it Lisaka, Lisaka Technology. So they've had a change of name. And they've also had a change of a business model, as he explained it. And I think what happened was probably after two decades of having been at Standard Bank, you sort of want to start looking for new challenges. And the challenge couldn't be more enormous than an organization that was widely discredited for the conduct that it had undertaken. And obviously the fact that the victims of its conduct would have been the poorest of the poor, the pensioners. So I think it was obviously a big, you know, jump for him to then say, there's an organization that I want to be able to fix and I want to be able to address some of its issues. But when you go through the book, you sort of then understand what would have motivated him to do that. Because even his transition from government, where he had been actively engaged in, you know, the transition politics, if you can call it that, trying to assist uh, the politicians of the day manage their way through the post-1994 transition, and how he then moved into the corporate role of banking. He's a guy that's always been keen to be challenged and keen to explore new things. And I think this challenge, even though it was surprising for a lot of people, when you then read the rest of the story, you can sort of then sort of track uh, the linear pathway towards what became a very interesting job. Yeah, Lissaka Technologies, of course. I first met Lincoln Marley, and I was telling everyone earlier that I've got a VHS tape somewhere of an interview I did with a much younger Lincoln Marley, who was, when he was still a communist, um, at, <laughs> at Rhodes <laughs> University, probably in 1990 or thereabouts, um, and doing a, a university video project and interviewing this bright-eyed young activist, this guy with his entire future ahead of him, and just so excited about it, quoting the Freedom Charter and all sorts of other things. Does he stay true to those values, those sort of those old values that he um, was cultivating in those days, do you think? I think a lot of those values have remained with him. And of course, when you look at how he got, uh, you know, he got into struggle politics, having been a student in a country that was facing particular upheaval, he has, uh, he he also keeps emphasizing the value of his family background and the grounding that it gave him. In that even in instances when he was going into frontline politics, it was always quite important for him to be able to stay true to some of the key principles that his father in particular had imparted upon him. Him. And I think obviously having been engaged in student politics, you sort of learn to have a different understanding of what matters in the country and what the key issues needed to be. But the one thing that seems to have uh, been his saving grace, if I can call it that, was this commitment to remaining educated. And I think it is that ability to remain ahead of the education curve that made it easy for a person like him to do, to, to do some uh, level of frontline politics and then still be able to transition into an alternative career. And as we now know, that has become quite important in recent years where it's very clear that far too many of our political leaders and our political principles don't have a lot in the way of options, which then explains why they hold on to the job that they have. And of course, as uh, as political fans shift and there's less um, availability of such spaces for them to occupy, we've seen uh, what the the contestations can be in that particular space. So I think he got very fortunate in that education was so embedded in him, he was never going to be one of those that got stuck in the political consensus simply because there were no other options.
Well, because I mean, we, we haven't heard much of Lesaka Technologies at all, better known as Net One UEPS. It got, uh, um, it got to, to, to drawn into the whole scandal around social grant payments and all sorts of stuff uh, more than a decade ago now. Yeah. Um, and it yeah. lost the contracts for that. I mean, so he's trying to rebuild then uh, what was Net One UEPS. Um, yeah. Blazing a trail, lessons for African leadership. Is it a is it a memoir? Is it an autobiography? Is it is it an important leadership book in your view? I think it's an interesting and a quite an important leadership book, particularly because it does tap into the key dimensions of leadership in politics and leadership in the corporate boardroom. And I think in South Africa, whenever we talk about leadership failures, we naturally gravitate towards political leadership failures and also corporate leadership failures, simply because when those people do something that is spectacularly bad, it tends to have an impact on people who didn't even know that such individuals existed. So I do think that when he then reflects at how he took over some of the struggling businesses for Standard Bank in places like Zimbabwe and Malawi, for example, and what he learned, learned, learned about, firstly, the need for humility, but also the importance of understanding the ground before imposing your own leadership um, uh, uh, you know, dimension onto an institution. I think for a lot of leaders, there will be things that resonate with them, particularly because he came in from you know, the outside. He wasn't groomed as an investment banker, but the ability to listen and the ability to then pay attention to the small details seems to have distinguished him. And some of the anecdotes that the people share about him in the book do, and do, do sort of highlight that one of his key leadership traits is a simple ability to just to listen to the small conversations and then gradually build that institutional wisdom that it enables him to lead people in a way that enables them to say, well, he's a guy who actually knows what he's doing. Uh, and it takes quite a lot of courage to go into a place that has been fraught with controversy. I mean, NetOne UEPS um, you know, was a minefield, I'm sure, uh, for him to, to enter. How does he explain that decision-making process, that decision to go from a, a career, which maybe, you know, maybe he's peaked at uh, running the card division and everything else, and he, he could have kept going, I'm sure, for many years um, in yeah. terms of drawing a big salary, lots of uh, very attractive share options, all of these things. In the same way as Dondo Mohajani, for example, has ended up at the Moti Group, um, you go, hold yeah. on a second, how are how do you make that decision? And my producers, we must talk to Dondo about this. And as as to how and the, and the Moti Group, nobody can quite put a finger on it. They describe it as the controversial Moti Group. Um, and you just go from a personal reputation point of view. How much of a risk are you taking when you yeah. leap into other environments that you don't fully understand until you've actually yeah. got your feet under the table? after a while? Look, I, I do think it was probably his greatest gamble, uh, at least the greatest gamble of his modern life because the way he seems to conceptualize it is that, look, it was an institution, an institution that clearly had a bad track record, had a bad culture, but it was an institution that could be fixed. And I think when a person wants to take on a challenge of that nature, it does unfortunately become their defining legacy moment because how he does at Lisaka will actually then uh, determine how the rest of us see him in his later years. So if, he, if this bombs spectacularly, we'll forget about all the good things that he could have done at Standard Bank and we'll always attach it to the question of, well, how big was this shape paycheck that enabled you to move from a stable institution, highly credible institution, to one that clearly was the opposite of that. And I think, obviously, for him, perhaps it came at a point in time in his career where he felt that, look, after two decades at a particular institution, you've probably explored everything that could be done there. I think the portfolio that is led and the business that is led, you've probably exhausted the, the majority of what is possible within any singular institution. And this Lusaka rebranding, where Lusaka is trying to position itself as something completely different, so a technology that enables financial inclusion is going to be their driving motto. That is something that might be appealing to someone, but of course, the, 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 the reputation considerations, that would have been much stronger for me. I personally don't think I would have done that type of a leap, but obviously for him, he's decided that his legacy is going to be defined by how courageous he was, rather than him retreating back to zone of comfort. Yeah, it's such an interesting perspective. Kaya, thank you very much for sharing with us this evening. Kaya Sitole, independent political analyst, has been uh, devouring, I don't think he's been reading, I think he's been devouring uh, Lincoln Marley's book, Blazing a Trail, Lessons in African Leadership. Lincoln Marley, who for two decades was at Standard Bank, came out of government and into Standard Bank and made that transition very successfully and has subsequently moved to become the chief executive at what used to be called Net One UEPS, the company that got itself 
uh, very severely maligned in the social grants process and the fees and the charges and all of that sort of stuff. They've rebranded themselves Lesaka Tech uh, Technologies, and um, that is the company. I was I couldn't hear it properly. I couldn't hear Kaya's uh, explanation properly. I thought it was VBS. I, thought, I didn't hear that. Hold on a second. What did I miss? Hate missing things, but I had heard like, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Lincoln Miley had gone to Net One, um, and yeah, hopefully he makes a success of it. Hopefully he can turn it around. Hopefully he can restore the reputation of a company that has felt the need to rebrand.